Uh, kia ora koutou everyone and thank you for coming along. It's my great pleasure to welcome tonight Professor Stephen Smith, who is the 2017 New Zealand Law Foundation Distinguished Visiting Fellow. And it's also a great pleasure to, to welcome his wife Susan, who's coming along to this lecture, especially tonight, which is very brave of Stephen and Susan to be here in the same room <laughs> together. Um, uh, Stephen is James McGill Professor at the Faculty of Law at McGill University, where he teaches primarily in the fields of private law, common and civil law, and legal theory. He's a former clerk to the then Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada, Brian Dixon. Um, he's also a graduate of Queen's University, uh, the University of Toronto, and the University of Oxford. Professor Smith was a fellow in law at St Anne's College, Oxford from 1991 to 1998, and has been a visiting professor at the Universities of Texas, Tel Aviv, uh, Marseille, uh, Singapore, I must say, Singapore and Queensland. Stephen's research is mainly in the areas of private law and private law theory. He's the author of Contract Theory, published by Oxford University Press, and co-author of Atiyah's Introduction to the Law of Contract, um, published by Oxford University Press. Professor Smith was the recipient of a Gilliam Fellowship for 2009 to 2011. He's currently writing a book on private law remedies, which I'm sure is going to be an absolute um, ripper for, for all of us to understand this, this theory. Um, I would like to welcome Professor Smith here, and he's going to talk about um, his book tonight, really, um, Rights, Wrongs and Injustices, The Structure of Remedial Law. Please give Professor Stephen Smith a big Otago welcome. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Mark, for those uh, kind words. I think I'll do it this way. Um, and I also want to thank the Law Foundation, who has sponsored my visit. And I want to give a really big thanks to everyone at Otago. It's been a really very warm welcome. I've been warmly welcomed everywhere um, in New Zealand. But honestly, I can say this is the warmest welcome. Um, a lot goes to Mark. And I want to thank Lauren, in particular, who've really uh, looked after me well. Jessica, um, Simon, who uh, all have looked after me very well. Thank you. So, in, as Mark said, in this lecture, I'm going to um, present some of the main ideas in a book that I'm writing on private law remedies. And my presentation is going to focus on two questions, two basic questions. What is a remedy and when are remedies available? And I'll also say a little bit when I'm answering that second question about the third of the questions on that sheet about the particular kinds of remedies that courts give. But I thought that before I turn to those questions, I might give a little background to explain how I came to this project. And the, the project's origins lie in two puzzles. So the first puzzle was pedagogical. A few years ago, I was asked by my dean to teach a course on private law remedies. So I put together a list of materials based on sort of standard textbooks and other people's courses um, in remedies. And then I sat down to do um, what I normally try to do, which is try to find a common thread or principle or question to tie the materials together. And I failed. I couldn't do it. It just seemed to me a kind of sort of incoherent mix of things. Large parts of the courses were about the rules on specific relief. But these seemed to be all about when you will get a particular kind of remedy. Most of the rest of the course was basically rules about damages, but these weren't about when you got damages. These were about how you quantify the amount of damages that someone might get. And it wasn't clear to me what these different kinds of rules had in common. And when I went further and thought about the other parts of the course, rules on self-help or rescission, I couldn't see what they had in common with any of those things. So um, I was puzzled. Now, it's true, of course, that you could say all those rules were remedial in the sense that they were trying to come up with a, um, a solution of some kind to a problem of some kind. But if you just adopt that very broad definition of remedial, uh, everything I taught in contract and tort is remedial. Indeed, the whole of law is remedial. Right? Law is a remedy for the problems that arise in a world where you don't have law. So I was puzzled by the course that I was taking, or that I was teaching. But I reflected on this, and eventually I came to the view, oh, there is something distinctive about at least some of these rules that I'm teaching, something that's different from the kind of core rules that I was teaching in my classes in contract and tort. And um, this is, was, um, it seemed to me that the rules, um, and it still seems to me, that the rules on specific relief were distinctive um, because um, these rules were fundamentally rules for courts. They tell courts how to act. 
Another way of putting it is arguably these are public law rules. Their concern is the action of state officials. Now, it's true, of course, that all legal rules are applied by courts, right? But the rules governing specific relief, they're not just applied by courts, they tell courts how they should act. In particular, they tell courts what they should do when people come before them and ask for particular kinds of um, assistance. So they tell courts you shouldn't give um, uh, grant requests for specific performance if damages would be adequate. By contrast, the rules that make up substantive law, for example, the core rules of contract and tort law, are different. These rules, I think, are basically addressed to citizens. They tell each of us how we should be treating each other in ordinary day-to-day -day life. So they say things like, fulfill your contractual promises, don't trespass, don't hit others, don't steal, right? and so on. And it seemed to me, and still seems to me, that there's an important distinction here. It's important because the question of how citizens should treat each other in their day-to-day -day life is different from the court question of what courts should do when citizens come to them for assistance. Different considerations apply. So when we're trying to explain the rules, evaluate them, perhaps reform them, it's going to differ depending on whether we think these are rules for citizens or rules for courts. So I thought I'd just give you a non-legal example <coughs> to illustrate the point. <coughs> so a few years ago, when, my children were when our children were still living at home, um, my younger son came up to me one night uh, fuming mad. And he was fuming mad at his older brother. And he was mad at his older brother because he said his older brother had promised to help him with his homework. And now he was refusing to do this. And he wanted me to do something about it. Right? So I called in my older son and I interrogated him. Right? This is, we live in Quebec, which is a civil law jurisdiction, so the inquisitorial method is <laughs> still used. So I determined that indeed, yes, this promise had been made. And in fact, my older son admitted it much, as much. But subsequently, they fell into a disagreement over some kind of unrelated thing, and now he just didn't want anything, didn't, you know, he wasn't going to help. Right? So what did I do? Right? So my younger son wanted a kind of specific performance remedy, right? He wanted me to order his older brother to help him, right? So what did I do? Now, I don't know, you know, it looks like we have a few parents here. If you're a parent, what do you think, right? Well, I refused. Why? Well, it wasn't because I thought that my older son had a good excuse. I thought he should help his younger brother with his homework. In our family, the law is that promises are meant to be kept. But I refused, I think, for the obvious reason that if I ordered specific performance, 10 minutes later, they are going to be back before the court <laughs> arguing again, right? So I decided on an alternative remedy. Now, it wasn't damages. Our family is not that legalistic. But I did try to find a substitute as best I could. I think I ordered my older son to um, do some of my younger son's chores, to, to do the dishes so that the younger son would have extra time now that he could work on his homework. Now, it's a really simple example, but I think it illustrates the distinction between substantive law and remedial law. So the reason I refused specific performance had nothing to do with whether I thought my older son should help his younger brother. That's a question of substantive law, and I thought he had a duty to do that. But the remedial question is, what do I do? And all of a sudden, different considerations apply, in particular that my time, I thought, was very valuable. And um, those considerations applied uniquely to me. Right? So um, I, that, I, didn't, um, I didn't order performance of the duty that I thought existed. So thinking about, reflecting on that led me to the view that probably the most useful definition of a remedy is that it's essentially a judicial ruling. And specifically, private law remedies, which is my interest, are judicial rulings that are intended to resolve private law disputes. And the law of remedies, then, is the law that governs the availability and the content of such rulings. So I felt happy. I now had a definition of the content of the course, of the subject matter of the course I was teaching. But then immediately I've got, had, I found, oh, I've got another problem, which is I don't know what I'm supposed to be teaching. I mean, I know specific relief, but what else fits in there? What other private law rules are for courts as opposed to for citizens? And in particular, where do the rules on damages and restitution fit in this scheme? Are those rules for citizens or are those rules for courts? And the answer wasn't obvious. Indeed, the question seems barely to have been asked. 
if you look at discussions, whether in textbooks or in judicial rulings, you see constant references to liabilities to pay damages or liable to have to make restitution. But it's almost never clear whether what is meant is that you're liable to fall under a substantive duty to do this or you're just liable to being ordered by a court to do it or indeed whether that difference even matters. More generally, when you look at most books on remedies, um, they rarely raise the question of how is if at all are the rules that are being discussed here different from the rules that are taught in substantive law courses. And of course, as you know, most of the rules that are in most remedies books are actually taught in substantive law courses as well. So it's not clear that anyone's really thought too much about this. So that's the first puzzle, how to determine the content of this body of law. The second puzzle was philosophical. So when I started teaching remedies, I was also teaching jurisprudence, general legal theory. And not surprisingly, I became interested in what does jurisprudence have to say about legal, about rulings, right? In particular, about the kind of rulings I was interested in, about orders, telling people to do things, right? And what I found was it had very little to say, almost nothing. And initially, this was, this was a bit surprising, you think about it. There's basically I think, three main ways that the law tries to impose itself directly on us. So the first is by announcing or recognizing substantive rules, right? Rules like do not trespass or um, fulfill your contractual promises, right? Um, these rules, sometimes they, the examples I give, they impose duties. Everyone has a duty to fulfill their contractual promises or sometimes they tell you how to make those duties. You need an offer and acceptance. But we have these substantive rules. And then, of course, we have sanctions, right? We throw you in jail sometimes, or we seize your property. But the third way is that we have courts making rulings, courts telling you, pay some money, get off the land, something like that, right? The first and the second of those methods, making rules and sanctions, have been studied extensively by legal scholars and legal theorists, right? Just about everything written about general legal theory is either about the rules, Right? Or it's about sanctions, you know, rules, that's Hart, sanctions, that's Austin. Right? Or it's about both of those. But almost nothing has been written about um, um, rulings, about rulings. And in fact, the, the, in particular, nothing's been written about the very most basic question, why do we issue them? What's the point of ordering somebody to do something? And you might think, well, that's obvious, but it's not obvious. Why order? somebody, why should a court order, say, pay $100 to the plaintiff when we've already got rules that can say the same thing and we've got sanctions that we can do if they don't follow the rules? What's the point of the order in the middle? So reflection on this puzzle led me to think that we don't really have a good account of the nature and the role of legal rulings. And further, as I thought about the ways that rulings differ from rules and from sanctions, it became clear to me that understanding these differences was critical to understanding why courts make the particular kinds of rulings that they make. So in short, these two projects, the, or two, uh, these two projects, understanding private law remedies, the pedagogical puzzle, and understanding rulings came together. And the book that I'm writing is basically the outcome of that merger. It's not a treatise. It's fundamentally an argument, a very long argument, and basically a long argument for taking its subject matter seriously. It's basically an argument for asking serious questions about what courts are doing when they issue rulings. <clears throat> and the argument has, has two prongs to it. So the first prong, which is my focus today, is a response to the pedagogical puzzle that I mentioned. Right? And this response seeks to establish the scope and the structure of remedial law, in particular, private law, remedial law. The other prong of the argument is a response to that jurisprudential puzzle that I mentioned. And the core idea here is that rulings, and in particular rulings that require defendants to do things, what I call directive rulings, provide distinctive reasons for actions. They provide reasons that are different than those provided by rules or by sanctions. Now, the jurors, I'm not going to go into the jurisprudential argument in detail today, but I thought it might be useful if I gave you a couple of examples. Again, they're non-legal examples to help illustrate, to get you thinking about the difference between rules and orders and sanctions, because that's really a, the kind of 
core foundational idea on which my work uh, depends. So in my household, like in, in our household, I'm not used to saying that, in our household, like in most households, my wife and I employ each of the methods that the law employs. So we have rules, we use orders, and we impose sanctions. So we have a rule, uh, do not throw food at the dinner table, right? And if that rule's broken, my usual response is to issue an order, stop it, stop throwing food. Right? And if that doesn't work, my next usual response, at least when the children were younger, was a sanction, uh, sending the offender to his or her room. Right? Now the question is, what is the point of the order in the middle of that? Why am I saying the order? It just seems to repeat the rule. Why bother? Right? Now, it's sometimes suggested that the order is a reminder or a clarification of the rule. But that seems implausible to me. The rule is clear, it was very well known, and the order isn't expressed, it's expressed as an order, not as a clarification or a declaration of the rule. It's sometimes also um, assumed that the order is a warning or a threat of a sanction, right? But that also seems implausible. An order isn't expressed as a warning, it says nothing about the possible sanctions, and in many cases, orders are given even when there's no possibility of issuing a sanction. So I still occasionally issue orders to my older son, but he's now six foot five, and there's absolutely no possibility that I'm going to sanction him. But I still sometimes order him around, and you know what, it still sometimes works, right? Why am I doing that? Well, the reason I suggest is that I'm trying to invoke a distinctive kind of authority, in particular kind of authority that's different than that on which I'm relying when I enact or recognize rules. So rules like don't throw food at the table are basically statements in legal form, they're basically statements that a certain duty exists. Everyone has a duty not to throw food. By contrast, an order is just a command, stop throwing food. So when I announce a rule, what I'm hoping is that my children will accept that what it says is true. Right? It's just a statement, you have this duty or everyone has this duty. And so I'm hoping that they'll accept that that's true, that in fact, yeah, they do have that duty. That is the right thing um, for them to do. But when I'm making an order, I'm not telling them what their duties are. At this point, I'm just basically asking for obedience. I'm saying, you have to obey me now. And what I'm saying is that the authority to declare duties, which is what we do when we pass rules, everyone has a duty to do X, is different from the authority to command obedience. Stop it. Right? I have a philosophical argument for this, which I'm not going to give you now, but I'll, I, I'll just try to see whether some of our ordinary practices um, make you think that, yeah, maybe that's plausible. So I think it's reflected in ordinary practices. So if my son questions the no throwing food rule, right, what I will probably try to do is explain to him why he should think of this as a valid duty. So I might try to explain that throwing food is wasteful, or you're going to injure somebody, or it's going to inhibit morally uplifting dinner table conversation, right? I might also explain that by virtue of my age and great experience, that I'm an authority on the kind of duties that you should have, at least in comparison to him, right? And I'm offering these explanations in the hope that he'll accept that what that the rule actually does what it purports to do, namely to state a valid duty. But if my son continues to refuse to comply with the rule, then I'll usually switch to the different kind of authority embodied in orders. And I'll say, stop throwing food. And when I do this, what I'm, to say, I'm invoking my presumed right to be obeyed. Maybe I don't actually have the right to be obeyed, but when I say it, that's what I'm presuming. Regardless of the merits of the action, Right? And like many of us, I make this, often make this switch between these two kinds of authority explicit. What I often do, I say, oh, after I've gone through the rule, da, 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 I say, fine, I don't care what you think. Stop throwing food. Now, I don't know if you've ever said that, but if you have, why do you say, I don't care what you think? Because this is not a question about whether it's right or wrong to throw food anymore. This is now a question about whether you're going to obey me. And that's a different matter, okay? We can disagree about the food, but disagreeing about this, 
That's more serious. Now, I'm not saying you should obey me, or he should obey me, or you should obey the law, but I'm saying that's what we're doing when we're making orders. We're trying to invoke a different kind of authority. <clears throat> so the lesson of that story is that there can often be good reasons to issue orders, even when they're just replicating the content of a rule, as in my example, right? Because we're providing the recipient with a new reason, a different reason to do that action. No, it's not just because you had a duty to do it. It's because I'm ordering you to do it. Right? We can also tweak this story a little bit to illustrate that in some circumstances, we might want to use orders instead of rules, not even have a rule, just use an order. And I think that many private law orders are like this, but I'll give, I'm going to give an example that's it's more of a public or, or criminal law example. So, Again, when the children were younger, if they threw food at the table and continued throwing food at the table, then um, usually a sanction would follow. In our family, uh, usually something like being sent to their room. Right? Probably bad parenting today, but put that to the side. My interest is how is this sanction, this punishment, communicated? Right? Now, one possibility is you could have a rule. Right? And the rule would say anyone who throws food at the table has a duty to go to their room. Right? You throw food, you have a duty to go to your room. Our household never had a rule like this. Right? And the law never has rules like this. Right? You'll never see rules that impose duties on wrongdoers to perform actions that are intended as punishment. What you find instead is that punishments are always communicated by orders. If my son was throwing food, I wouldn't say, don't. Don't you know you had a duty to go to your room as soon as you threw the food? No, I would just order him to his room. And that's the same when you commit a crime. It's courts order you to prison, or their, their delegates do that. Right? Now, the question is why? Why? So that just shows you that th there's one situation where we're using orders and not even using rules at all. Of course, when you can get an order, that's governed by rules. But those rules are for courts. My point is that there's no rules for the citizens here. So why? Why don't we use rules to impose punishments? Right? So why don't we have a substantive rule that says something like, anyone who parks in a handicapped zone has a duty to immediately pay the city $300. Right? There are no rules like that. Right? And I've looked very carefully at all the parking tickets to make sure on this. And they, don't just, <laughs> right, there's, right, they don't say that. Right? Why not? Well, the reason I suggest is that we don't think wrongdoers have duties to punish themselves. If you think about the justifications for punishment, retribution, deterrence, whatever, those are never justifications for punishing yourself, for sort of you know, locking yourself in the basement for two years or burning some money in your pocket, right? They're justifications for the state imposing a punishment on you, right? Indeed, imagine that we did have a piece of legislation like the one I just said that says, um, anyone who parks in a handicapped zone has a duty to pay the state $300. What would happen? Well, I think we would interpret that as imposing a price. It, if I want to park there, I just have to pay $300. We wouldn't think of it as a punishment. And the reason we would interpret it that way is that's the only way to make sense of what it says. It says we have a duty, but nobody thinks you have duties to punish yourself. But duties to pay price, yeah, that makes perfect sense. So that's how would we interpret it. And that's one reason that we don't use rules to impose punishments. Right. Now, this is a very complex issue. These comments just kind of scrape the surface of it. But the, the point of these examples is to get you to think about the possibility that there's something different between rules, orders, and sanctions. And there might be situations, distinctive things that orders can do that rules can't do or that orders do differently than rules do. Right? Okay, so that's kind of the build-up. Let me go back to the original, to the two questions. What is a remedy and when are remedies available? So I should be clear by now, my answer to the first is that a remedy is a judicial ruling and a private law remedy in particular is a judicial ruling intended to resolve a private law dispute. In the rest of the talk, and indeed what I've been talking about, in the former part of the talk, I'm going to focus on a particular kind of private law ruling, which I call a directive ruling or an order. And this is a ruling that requires the defendant to do or not to do something. So the main examples are specific performance orders, injunctions, orders to pay damages or debt, orders for the recovery of land or property. <clears throat> 
These are the most common type of private law ruling, and I think they're the most important ones if we're trying to understand not just remedial law, but also substantive law. And I'm going to call these orders because that's how they're described in England. That's how all of these rulings in England today are expressed as orders to do things. Right? So what are the practical implications of this definition? Well, first, it excludes from remedial law things that you often find in remedies textbooks. So things like rules on um, self um, uh, self-help or stipulated damages clauses. For, mo for me, those are just substantive law. Right? A stipulated damages clause is just a, cl uh, a clause in a contract telling someone to pay money in certain circumstances. That's part of substantive law. The second implication is that some things you don't find in typical remedies textbooks are part of remedial law. So in particular, a large amount of the law that governs private law defenses is remedial. So many defenses aren't reasons for individuals to act differently in their day-to-day -day life. They're reasons for judges to not give a remedy or not give a particular kind of remedy. So the obvious example is something a limitation period. Right? Limitation period, you're not supposed to not pay your debt just because the limitation period is clear. And the judges are very clear about that. But judges won't give you a remedy at that point. Right? And I think and the same is true of many formalities, immunities, res judicata, abusive process, and lots of the law of illegality. The third implication is that much of the law that is found in remedies books belongs there. So as it turns out, in the end, I decided, yeah, you know what, most of what I was teaching did fit together, right? So to begin, as I've already said, most obviously the rules on specific relief, these seem to me to be rules for courts. Um, the rules governing um, when courts will issue orders to pay debts or orders for the recovery of land, again, those are remedial. There's not very many rules like this. There's really very few, but what there are are remedial. Most importantly, in my view, most of the law of damages and much of the law of restitution is remedial law. Now, that might seem obvious, but it's very controversial, at least as the way I've defined remedies. And it's controversial because many writers believe that wrongdoers have substantive duties to pay damages, duties that arise at the moment they committed a wrong. And many writers, usually the same ones, also believe that individuals who've been unjustly enriched, who've received money by mistake, have a duty from the moment of the enrichment to make restitution. And if that's what you think, then the law of damages and the law of restitution are part of substantive law. They tell individuals what they should do in the case that they've committed a wrong or that they are unjustly enriched. Right? So in this, in this view, an order by the court to pay damages or to make restitution is just like an order to pay a debt. It's just telling the defendant to do what he or she should have already done. Right? The only remedial law is just a kind of general rule that if somebody hasn't performed a substantive duty to pay a sum of money, then we're going to order them to do it. Nothing else going on. Now, I once held this view of both damages and restitution. I've, I don't hold it anymore. I'm happy to discuss um, uh, in questions why I don't hold it anymore. But I've written about it um, quite a bit in some articles. So I'm just going to give two reasons, one for damages, one for restitution. Why? That's not my view. So damages. So in the common law, um, it's clear law, and I think it's been very clear law for over eight, 800 years, that it's no defense to a claim for damages that you offered to pay the amount sought. So let's say I break your window, and I'm pretty sure it's going to cost about 100 bucks to fix it. So I go up to you and I say, look, I'm sorry I broke your window. I'll give you, here's $100. And you say, bugger off, I don't want to talk to you, you're mad at me, whatever, go away. And you sue me, and you go to court, and you ask for $100, and the judge determines that that's the appropriate amount of damages, and I say, well, I already tried to pay the $100. It is no defense, right? you will win. Now, that makes no sense if I had a substantive duty to pay damages, because I tried to pay it, and you declined it. If I owe you money, and you declined it, that's the end of it, I don't owe you the money anymore. But here, it's no defense. Indeed, even if I paid you the money, so let's just say I sent you $100 in the mail, said, sorry about the window, here's $100. And then you sue me, and I say to the jet, I already paid the $100. It's no defense. You still win. Now, in that case, I might get the $100 back in an action in unjust enrichment, 
but as a matter of the law of damages, you still win. That doesn't make any sense if there is a duty to pay damages at the moment of the wrong. Restitution. So if there was a duty to make restitution following an unjust enrichment, so for example, if you had a duty from the moment you received money by mistake to repay the money, then if you didn't do it, that should be a legal wrong, right? You've infringed the duty, right? And there should be possibility of me getting damages. Let's say I paid you money by mistake. And because you didn't pay it to me right, right away, I ended up suffering. I had to go borrow money at exorbitant rates of interest or my business went bankrupt or something. I suffered lots of damages. I should be able to sue you for those. I can't, right? Failing to make restitution is not a legal wrong. There's no damages for failing to do it. Just as there's no damages for failing to pay damages, there's no damages for failing to make restitution. And to my mind, that doesn't make any sense if you thought there was a duty to make restitution. So for those reasons, and, and quite a few others that, that I've written about elsewhere, in my view, the law of damages and most of the law of restitution is remedial law. It's rules not telling citizens what they should do, but courts what they should do when people come to them for assistance. They say, well, why does it matter? Who cares who these rules are for? Well, it, it matters for lots of reasons, but the main ones, if we're trying to understand the rules, um, it makes a big difference. If there's no duty to pay damages before the order, why not? Right? Um, you know, if we think this is just expressing some moral obligation, then you would think there should be. Maybe something else is going on. Might it be, and this is in fact my case, that damages are a little closer to punishment, something that we are imposing on you, and it's important that the court does it rather than just that you do it by yourself. And it makes you think about the roles of damages differently. Like if you think, I sort of think a little bit, like damages are partly symbolic, that makes perfect sense. They're only symbolic if a court orders you to do it. Paying it yourself, that's, that's not, that wouldn't have the same um, meaning. Okay, so the second question, when do we get remedies? Right? And this question has received surprisingly little attention in the common law. Um, of course, there's lots about when you get particular kinds of remedies, but just as a general, can we say anything general about when courts will give you remedies? A few scholars, uh, famously Blackstone, suggested that all remedies are remedies for wrongs. And some other scholars, uh, Peter Burks, for example, have suggested that all remedies are responses to proof of a right. So if you have a right, you get a remedy. Um, Blackstone, if there's a wrong, you get a remedy. I don't think either of those are true. They each get a little bit of the truth, but neither is true. In my view, as I've said, there's three basic causes of action in the common law, three basic reasons you get remedies, that there's a rights threat, that there's a wrong, and that there's an injustice. So, a rights threat arises where the defendant is unwilling to comply with a substantive duty. So, for example, if the defendant is trespassing over the claimant's property, or is failing to comply with a contractual covenant, then you have a rights threat. The defendant's actions are evidence that they're unwilling to comply with their substantive duties. And on proof of this unwillingness, courts will normally order performance of the duty. For example, they or order the defendant to stop trespassing. In my view, a rights threat is the normal cause of action for injunctions, specific performance, orders to pay a debt, and orders for the recovery of land or other property. And I'm calling this a rights threat, um, not just proof of a right, because it's the threat that, in my view, is the reason for issuing the ruling. You don't get an order just by showing that the defendant owes you a duty. Now, if you have a contractual duty not to compete with me, I can't just go to the court and say, order, them, order you to do that. No, the court will want to know that you are either not doing it or you're not about to do it. In other words, that my right that you don't compete is under threat. Right? Now, another way of putting this is that the reason for issuing a ruling in these cases is that the motivation provided by the substantive law, that kind of authority, hasn't worked. You're not willing to agree... To, to perform your substantive duty. And we know that because you're either infringing or about to infringe, or you're infringing somebody's rights. And so we want to make sure you stop infringing it or you don't do it in future. And so we try to bring in a different type of authority, the authority um, embodied in orders. A rights threat is also different from a wrong. So it's true that in many cases where the plaintiff's rights are under threat, the defendant has committed a wrong. So, if the rights threat arises from an ongoing trespass, then the defendant has already committed the wrong of trespass. But in 
but the relevance of the wrong in such cases is just evidence of the threat. It's evidence of the defendant's unwillingness to comply with the duty. And we know that because you can have rights threats without wrongs. Right? So if the, claim, if the plaintiff can show the defendant is intending to commit a trespass on his or her property, then subject to a few practical considerations, the courts will issue an order. No wrong has happened. We just have a threat of a wrong happening in the future. And it's also possible to have a wrong that is not a rights threat. Right? So if I just accidentally one-off trespass over your land, the courts will not order me not to do it again. I've committed a wrong, but I'm not threatening your rights. There's no chance I'm going to do it again, so they won't order it. Right? Now, as I mentioned a go moment ago, the rights threat, in my view, is the normal cause of action for injunctions, specific performance, orders to pay debt, orders for the recovery of land or property. Right? Not surprisingly, the content of these orders, what the defendant is ordered to do, just replicates the content of the substantive duty. Right? So an order to pay a debt or to cease a trespass commands the defendant to do what the substantive law already required them to do. But it's not quite the case that every order that's given in response to a right aren't always repli aren't replicative. Now these are orders that courts are making because a right is under threat, but rather than ordering the defendant to comply with the right, what they order the defendant to do is basically a substitute, to pay a sum of money sufficient to allow the plaintiff to obtain substitute performance from somebody else. So for example, let's say um, the defendant is failing to comply with a still binding contractual obligation to build a house. And if the plaintiff goes to the court, the court is not going to order the defendant to build the house. What they're going to do is order the defendant to pay a sum of money sufficient to allow the plaintiff to hire somebody else to build the house. Right? So these are a kind of creative order. The court, at the moment of the order, is creating a new duty. Prior to the order, the duty was to build the house. As soon as the court makes the order, it's now a duty to pay a sum of money. But they're not particularly creative orders because, in my view, they're basically an attempt to substitute for the actual duty. Right? Why do courts issue this? Well, this is basically my first example with my son. Right? The explanation is kind of, in my view, kind of boring, which is that monetary orders have practical advantages over specific relief. It's very easy to tell if they've complied with a monetary order, um, and it's easy to enforce them. You just seize their property. Right? By the contrast, specific performance is much more difficult to tell if it's been complied with and it's more difficult to enforce. Given that courts are publicly funded, scarce resources, it seems to me perfectly legitimate for them to take such considerations into account. Right, so the second cause of action is a wrong, and a proof of a wrong is the normal cause of action for most, although not in my view, all damages awards. Now again, this might be thought really obvious. Well, sure, we just, isn't that what damages always are? Damages are a response to a wrong. But as I, for reasons I mentioned a moment ago, that is actually controversial. Um, many writers believe that wrongdoers have substantive duties to pay damages, and if that's right, then the cause of action for damages is the same as for in order to pay a debt. It's a rights threat. Right? In this view, the only significance of the fact that the defendant has committed a wrong is it explains why the defendant had a duty to pay the money. But from the court's perspective, all we care about is you had a duty to pay money and you're not paying it, therefore the plaintiff's rights are under threat and we're going to order you to pay it. But if, like me, you reject that view of damages, then the cause of action for an order to pay damages must be the wrong. The order is a response to the wrong. There's nothing else there. Another way of making this point is that, in this view, all damages are a bit like punitive damages. Right? I hope it's incontrovertible that we don't have substantive duties to pay punitive damages. Nobody thinks, no court thinks when they're ordering the defendant to pay punitive damages that they're just telling the defendant to do something the defendant should have done a long time ago, pay these punitive damages. Right? For one thing, the defendant could never figure out how much to pay. Right? They think that they're creating that duty at that moment. In my view, all damages orders are like that. Right? So they're all creative. They are creating new duties at the moment of the order. Can we say anything more about the content of these awards beyond the fact 
that they are creative. Right? There's, of course, a huge amount of law governing the assessment of damages. But at the level that I'm discussing now, I don't think we can say a whole lot more about the content of such orders. So when you're giving an order in response to a rights threat, or as I'll explain in a moment, in response to an injust injustice, I think the content of the order is sort of straightforward. If it's a rights threat, we should order you, to, order you to comply with the right. If it's an injustice, we want to correct, revert, undo the injustice. But if it's a wrong, what's the obvious response to a wrong? I don't think there is any obvious or natural response to a wrong. Right? Just as there's many forms of punishment that we could use and still fulfill the same kind of aims that we fulfill today with incarceration, criminal punishment, I think there's many um, forms of private redress that could, in principle, achieve the aims that we currently pursue by awarding damages. Uh, Peter Burks once famously said, the courts would not be acting inconsistent inconsistently if their response to private wrongs was to order the wrongdoer's ears to be cut off. <coughs> now, I thought that was kind of crazy, but I now understand what he's saying. Right? It's not illogical. The fact that you've committed a wrong doesn't tell us what we should do. Now, Brooks also noticed that there are lots of good reasons that our response to wrongs is predictable, is humane, is proportionate, is easy to administer. And I think that explains why we have this very complicated rule of damages, why we make you pay damage, why damages are money, et cetera. Um, but in principle, at a general level, I don't think there's, you can say very much about what is the appropriate response to a wrong. Why does the law make these orders? Why do we order wrongdoers to pay damages? Now, that's a really big question that I do deal with in the book, but it's, it's too big for this talk. But I'm just going to say very briefly <clears throat> um, that I think the best way to think about most damages awards is that they're the private law equivalent of criminal punishment. Now, there's lots of explanations for why we punish criminals. But the most persuasive, in my view, many people's view, is broadly retributivist in nature. So according to this view, the aim of punishment, in very broad <laughs> terms, is to correct a kind of moral imbalance that has arisen because of the wrongdoer's action. And it's an imbalance between the wrongdoer and society. The wrongdoer has taken a liberty, denied to other people, created this kind of imbalance. The aim of punishment is to try to redress that balance, in very broad terms. So in most in my view, most damages orders have a similar aim. The difference, and it's a huge difference, but it's really the only difference, is that what we're trying to correct now is not something between society and the wrongdoer, it's between the wrongdoer and the victim. It's between the two people there. So, we're, so we make the wrongdoer pay damages to the victim in just the same way that we make wrongdoers go to jail. Right? We're trying to, I mean, it's, a, it's somewhat of a, I mean, I admit it's a mystery. How does putting somebody in jail correct this moral imbalance? I don't know, but we all do punishment. And, you know, we do this. We obviously think somehow we can do something like this. Whatever it can do, I think the same thing can happen within private law. Right? The third and final cause of action um, is an injustice. Now, that might, you might think, well, in the word injustice, that's so broad, that just covers everything. But I don't think that rights, threats, and wrongs are normally injustices. So it's wrong to hit, to lie, to steal, to break promises. But it seems to me very odd to describe those as injustices. Right? We normally only use the word injustice when there's an issue of fairness involved, when we're talking basically about allocating something between people. So that's why we always ask whether the tax system is just or unjust, right? Um, it's also the reason why we ask whether courts have acted justly. So by definition, <laughs> judicial decisions are always allocative. One party wins, one party loses, right? But the fact that you can always ask whether a court has acted justly doesn't mean that the causes of action on which claimants rely are injustices. In most cases, the causes of action are um, as I've said just now, it's either a wrong or it's a rights threat, which don't seem to me to be injustices. But certain causes of action, I think, are properly described as injustices. The clearest examples are legislative. So most common law jurisdictions, <coughs> just one example, have legislation that authorizes courts, has legislation authorizing courts to issue orders dealing with maintenance, 
and division of matrimonial property following the breakdown of a relationship of a marriage. Right? So in England, the legislation states that courts may, quote, make an order that either party to the marriage shall pay to the other um, such lump sum as may be so specified. Right? There is no suggestion in the legislation that, that plaintiffs seeking these orders have to show that the defendant did something wrong, that they had a duty to pay you the money, or anything like that. I mean, it's quite clear. All you have to show is that, um, broadly speaking, it would be fair in the circumstances to issue the order. Right? And whatever you think about those orders, it seems to me that the cause of action is appropriately described as an injustice. Right? They're not issued because the defendant acted badly or had a duty to do something, but they're issued, broadly speaking, because we think that the way that the substantive law of property is working has led to something that's an unfair distribution of resources, in other words, to an injustice. Now, non-legislative examples of causes of actions that are injustices are more controversial, um, but in my view, the cause of action for many, if not most, restitutionary orders is an injustice. In particular, the cause of action for an order to make restitution following a defective transfer. So somebody um, transfer, uh, pays money by mistake. Um, that the order to return that money is based on an injustice. So to obtain this order, the claimant doesn't have to show that the defendant had a substantive duty to return something to them, much less that they breach that duty. As I said, that doesn't from the law, it doesn't look like there's any such duty at all. What you just have to show, broadly speaking, is that the operation of the rules governing the passing of property have led to a distribution of resources that is unfair, or as I would say, unjust. Now this understanding of it, restitution is admittedly controversial. As I said earlier, there are many people who think there is a substantive duty to pay restitution, make restitution at the moment that you've been unjustly enriched. And if you believe that, then the cause of action for an order to make restitution is the same as the cause of action for, an, for specific performance. It's a rights threat. But if you reject this view, like me, then the cause of action falls into this third category, injustices. What about the content of these awards? Can we say anything about them? Well, like damage awards, these are creative awards. Indeed, I call these freestanding awards because they're the most creative. Right? These awards, they're not, they're not trying to duplicate a duty that already exists. They're not even a response. They're not even trying to respond to the breach of a duty. They're just completely standing. Right? They're creating an entirely new duty. So they're creative, but the content of them is really determined by the cause of action. If the cause of action is an injustice, then the obvious thing you should do is try to reverse the injustice, and that's what the courts do. If the, if, the cause of, if, if the cause of action arises from money paid by mistake, the courts order you to return the money. Okay? Why does the law make such orders? Why does it, why don't, what's the point of making these orders? Why couldn't we just have rules, for example, that do it? Again, I, can, I can't give you a full answer here, but very briefly, my um, answer is that these orders are a response to the limitation of substantive rules. And in the example I just give, just gave their responses to, limitate, to the limitations of substantive property law rules. So basically, I think the, what the law is doing in these cases, the examples I just gave, is something like this. It's saying, here's the law on property. Most of the time, these rules work really well. They're fine. But sometimes they don't. Sometimes they end up with situations that we, just, we, we think are unfair and unjust. So sometimes following the breakdown of a marriage or when money's paid by mistake. Now you might say, well, what you should do is fix the rules, fine-tune the rules. But there's a problem there. I mean, we do fine-tune the rules, but you can't fine-tune them, fine them too much or they wouldn't be rules. But in particular, there's a problem in property law. If you try to fine-tune the rules too much, they won't work because for property law rules in particular to work, they have to be very simple and they have to be general. They have to be things that third parties can figure out. Right? So there's a limit to how much you can change the substantive law of property to try to fix these problems. So what we're saying is, here's the rules. Most of the time they work fine. When they don't work fine, when there's a problem, when there's an injustice, come to us, the courts, and we'll fix it. We fix it with one-off orders. Okay. So let me conclude with a little bit of history. Just step back for a second. Okay. So for most of the common law's history, private law was basically remedial law. 
right, the writ system. It was basically rules about um, when you can get into court and what you would get from a court when you got there. The idea and the recognition of substantive law, of rules that tell citizens how they should behave towards one another in ordinary life, was a very slow process occurring over centuries. Indeed, I think it's still going on today. The courts and the writers responsible for this process, most famously Blackstone, but continuing um, in recent times to writers like Peter Burks, they drew on many sources. They drew on moral theory, they drew on continental writers, they drew on civil law, but their most important source was, of course, the existing law. Right? And that law, as I said, was largely remedial law. So the consequence, so there were many consequences of this way of developing the substantive law. It's left its mark all over our legal system. But the most general is basically that the, in the common law, I don't think we've ever fully separated or thought carefully about the distinction between substantive law and remedial law. Common law lawyers still tend to view substantive law through a remedial lens, right? You want evidence of this. It's why in many common law jurisdictions, it's normal, it's standard throughout most of North America to begin a contract law course by looking at remedies for breach of contract. Why do people do that? Why do teachers do that? Because they think if you want to understand a contractual duty, you need to understand what the remedy is. Right? It's the reason that it was an Amer you know, a, a common law judge, Oliver Wendell Holmes, who famously said that a contractual duty is just a duty to, pay the pro to perform the promise or to pay damages, and the law doesn't care which. Right? He thought about the duty through the remedial lens. Right? It explains why the law of unjust enrichment has long been described and is still described in many places, not as the law of unjust enrichment, but as the law of restitution. Right? Restitution is the remedy. It's what you get. That's what we call it, even though what we should be calling it is the law of unjust enrichment. I was talking yesterday with someone about this. Personal, another example, personal property. Why do we call personal property personal property? Right? And why do we, we have real property, land, and we have personal property. I never knew this. I went through the whole, the whole of law school. I had no idea why we never thought about it. Why we, I, I thought it was well, it's because, you know, my watch is mine. It's personal. But the land is mine, too. Why do we call it personal? Well, the reason we call it personal property is that the remedy was personal. Um, if you take my watch, I don't usually get the watch back, right? I can sue you, but all I'll get is damages. I won't get the watch. So we define that whole category um, in terms of the remedy. It's a personal remedy. It's just a remedy against you that you pay me money not to get the watch. Land was different. If, you, if you're on my land, I could kick you off. I got the land. So it was a real remedy, so we say it's a real right. There are still many writers who say that, the, that in the common law, I do not own this watch. Right? And they say that. Why don't I own it? Because if you steal it from me, the courts will not typically order you to give it back to me. They'll just order you to pay me a sum of money. Right? Now, for me, the explanation for that is really boring. It's the same one as my very first example with my son. It's just a whole lot easier to order people to pay money than order them to return watches. I'll go off script here for a moment. I'll give one of my, my favorite examples of this. I mean, I, these rules developed over centuries. They developed when we had circuit courts in England, right? We had judges who went from town to town, right? There was only one central court a long way away in London. It was circuit courts, right? You're going town to town. You're going to be back in six months. Somebody says, he stole my watch. Well, you could order specific performance, return the watch, but, or, you know, even better, he's, he, he's supposed to build a building for me. But that's a real problem if you order him to build a building. And then you go away, and you're not back on your horse for another six months. Because who's going to tell whether that building was done correctly or whether it's the right watch that was returned, right? Monetary remedies are a whole lot easier to enforce if you have a circuit judge, right? You just order the money, and it's easy for a bailiff or sheriff to tell if the money has been paid. So to me, there's a perfectly good explanation. I mean, it may not be a good explanation. It may not justify the full extent of the law today, but it's totally understandable that the common law does not order you to return this watch, even though we think you should do it, and even though I really do do it. As a matter of substantive law, I own this watch, you shouldn't take it. But as a matter of remedial law, we're not always going to order you to hand it back to me, because now we're dealing with, um, uh, with uh, remedial law where different considerations apply. So in this lecture, I've tried to argue that we need to take seriously this distinction between substantive and remedial law. And I've tried to answer, or at least 
point towards the answer to some of the questions that arise when we think about the law in this way. So um, is the law of damages or restitution remedial or substantive? But ultimately, what I've tried to convince you of is that these, not so much of my answers, but that these questions are important questions to ask. Thank you very much.